Father Boyle is the founder, executive director of Homeboy Industries, largest gang intervention. I really don't want to waste time. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Father Boyle. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. It's great to have you here and your support. Um, you know, I apologize. I ran into a bunch of people who say, oh, I've heard you before. And I thought, oh, great, you know. Um, I always remember it was at a foster grandparent gathering, uh, actually. It wasn't this gathering, but it was the, one of the largest uh, foster grandparent gatherings in Southern California. It was at Rancho Los Amigos. They had it two summers in a row. They invited, well, they invited me two summers in a row. And, and I thought, oh, God, you know, these people have heard me already. And so the second summer I was there, and um, this grandmother came up to me, and I think she liked the talk. She had big tears in her eyes, and she grabbed both my hands, and she said, I heard you last year. It never gets better. <laughs> so kind of hoping uh, she misspoke there, but maybe I'm delusional, you know. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I feel like I'm, I'm always at the endowment giving talks. I was here last week. I'll be here on Wednesday, and here I am again. Um, but it's just two uh, blocks from my uh, place. So, uh, uh, you know, I don't know a lot about kinship families, but I, what I want to talk about is kinship. I know there's a vision that brings you to what you do, which is so worthy and valuable. And uh, it's about a vision that you want the world to really look differently than it currently looks. What Mike was talking about right now, about if you work on families, then it, it has this payoff, you know that whole healthy families produce whole healthy people. And, uh, and who doesn't benefit from that? Uh, but there's a vision that undergirds what you do. Uh, the prophet Habakkuk writes, the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, wait for it. But none of you want to wait for too long. You know, you don't want con los brazos cruzados, you know, tapping your feet and staring at your watches. You want to make something happen. And, uh, and what is that thing that you want to make happen? This is a high aerial view. Look, you want to create a community in the end, a community of kinship, such that God, in fact, might recognize it. It's about obliterating once and for all this illusion that we're separate, that there is an us and a them. Mother Teresa, I think, diagnosed the world's ills correctly when she suggested that the problem in the world is that We've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? How do we imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle? How do we dismantle the barriers that exclude? How do we find our way to inch ourselves out to the margins, to the edges? Because if you stand at the margins, if you look under your feet, you'll discover that the margins are getting erased just because you've chosen to stand out there. And so we stand in our way in our own particularity with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. We stand with those whose dignity has been denied and those whose burdens are more than they can bear. Every once in a while you get this privileged moment to be able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out with the demonized, so that the demonizing will stop, and with the disposable, so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. I suspect that if kinship in the end was our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice. We would, in fact, be celebrating it. No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no peace. It's how it works. So for 30 years, I, I've worked with gang members, um, and it's been the privilege of my life, and honest to God, they've taught me everything of value. But in the last couple of years, they've taught me how to text, and uh, I'm so, I am so grateful to them, because I find that it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. And so I'm pretty good at it, you know, LOL, and OMG, and BTW, and the homies have taught me a new one, OHN which apparently stands for, oh, hell no. 
and I've been using that one quite a bit lately. Uh, so we're just down the block, and I have 400 employees there, and so I, I uh, you know, we gather at nine, and, and I had to go give a talk at a high school, and I brought two homies with me, older vatos, Manuel and Poncho, older guys have been to prison and tattooed, do a variety of things for me, and, and so we're in the car, and we're driving a couple hours to Palm Desert to this high school, and uh, Manuel's in the front seat, so he gets an incoming text, you know, and uh, he reads it to himself and he chuckles, and I said, what is it? And he goes, oh, it's dumb, it's from Snoopy back at the office. Well, I'd just seen Snoopy, Snoopy uh, gave me a big abrazote as the day began, and Snoopy and Manuel work together in the clock-in room where they clock in hundreds and hundreds of our workers, and it's, it's a tough job, actually. And I said, what's he say? Oh, gosh, it's dumb, hang on a second. Hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. <laughs> you have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, the three of us, we, you know, we died laughing. And then, and then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other. Now they shoot text messages. And there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How do we obliterate, once and for all, the illusion that we're separate? You know, even in service, there's a distance, and you want to bridge e even that, I think. You know, service provider, service recipient, there's a kind of a distance. We want to get beyond that. Um, at Homeboy Industries, I'm not the great healer, and that gang member over there is in need of my exquisite healing. The truth is, we're all in need of healing. We're all a cry for help. It's one of the things that joins us together as members of the human race. You know, one of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend. And I remember uh, he was one of the most attentive listeners. If you were talking to him, nobody else existed in the world. But I remember once a reporter had uh, commented to him and said, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar just shrugged and smiled and said, the feeling's mutual, which is, of course, the goal, is to arrive at this mutuality that's exquisite. There is no us and them, there's just us. So how do we, how do we bridge this distance that exists between us so that there is no daylight separating? No homie uh, found more job opportunities through Homeboy Industries than this guy everybody called Dreamer. His name was also Caesar. And Caesar, um, you know, he gang member, grew up in the housing projects where I was pastor and got into trouble and was sort of a yo-yo in and out of being locked up, especially this one period in his life, early 20s. But he'd get out, I'd find him a job opportunity in the private sector or with us, and but he'd always gravitate back to vague criminality, you know, usually something involving drugs, the sale of or the use of. And then he always wandered back to me. And this one time he had finished a four-month uh, stretch uh, probation violation at county jail, and there he is sitting in front of me. And he says what homies often say, this time it'll be different. I go, oh, gosh, all right. So with him sitting there, I called a friend of mine who runs a vending machine company in Alhambra, California, and he had hired homies in the past, so I was hoping against hope he'd do it again, and so he does. And he hires Caesar on the spot, and he says, uh, tell him to show up tomorrow. And so Caesar begins work at this uh, vending machine company. Well, two weeks later, there he is sitting in front of my desk, I go, híjole madre santa, here we go again. But this time, he pulls out of his pocket his very first paycheck, and he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. I mean, my mom, she's proud of me, and my kids, they're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, well, gosh, who? And he looks at me strangely, and he says, well, God, of course. I said, oh, sure, no. <laughs> No, that's, that's right. That, that would be God, yeah. He said, you thought I was going to say you. I said, no, gosh. God's, God's number one. He said, you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. I'm sorry, them Genesis days. 
He goes, yeah, because God would have been had struck down your ass already by now, he says. You know. <laughs> All I remember is we just sort of dissolved in laughter. We fell out of our chairs. And I don't know. I defy you to identify exactly who's the service provider, who's the service recipient. It's mutual. Well, Homeboy Industries was born uh, a long time ago, in 1988, during the time I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, Dolores Mission. And it was nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village. And at the time, they comprised the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. And we had eight gangs at war with each other, uh, making it, according to the LAPD, the place of the highest concentration of gang activity in the whole city was my parish. I didn't know this. I buried my first young person killed because of the sadness in 1988, and I buried my 183rd three weeks ago. So we did a lot of things in those early days. First thing we did was we started a school because there were so many junior high age, middle school age uh, gang members who had been given the boot from their home school. Nobody wanted them. And so they were wreaking havoc in the projects and violent and selling drugs. And, and so I walked out to each one of them and I said, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And uh, to my surprise, they, they all said yes. And then I couldn't find a school that would take them, you know, so that kind of forced my hand. So I went to the convent, which at the time was uh, located on the third floor of our um, elementary school. So the first two floors were our parochial school. Third floor, the whole floor was the convent. And I gathered the nuns together and I said, hey, would you guys mind, you know, like moving out? And, um, <laughs> and we could turn the place into a school for gang members. And they said, sure. And so we did, and, and that brought gang members in large numbers to the church, uh, which uh, upset the apple cart a little bit, because aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed, you know, good people in and bad people out, and, and that was a good challenge, a gospel challenge, in fact. And then the gang members said, if only we had jobs, and so myself and the women in the parish, we marched around all the factories trying to find felony-friendly employers, you know, and... That wasn't so forthcoming, so uh, we couldn't wait any longer. We hired a lot of homies to do things, like build a child care center, um, graffiti removal, kind of light man uh, landscaping kind of crews. And we couldn't wait, so I went to a movie producer, and I said, hey, buy this old abandoned bakery across the street from the church, and we'll call it Homeboy Bakery, and we'll have rivals from these eight gangs bake bread together. And he said, sure. And so we did. And then about a month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market in downtown LA. Once we had plural, we came up with the highfalutin name Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this venture. Uh, not everything worked, I'll be the first to admit it. Homeboy Plumbing really was not hugely <laughs> successful. Um, who knew? You know, people didn't want gang members in their homes. I, uh, I did not see that coming, you know. <laughs> and nobody ever intends to do something like this, but we just have backed our way in the last 25 years into becoming the largest gang intervention, rehab, and reentry program in the world. <clears throat> so we have uh, about 15,000 folks a year wander into our office. Uh, we are not a program for those who need help, only for those who want it, because recovery only works that way. You have to want it. But once you walk through our doors, it's ticker tape parade and red carpet, and we have about 44 curricular offerings from anger management to parenting to grief and loss uh, for anybody off the street, uh, but gang members in particular who are part of our 250 trainees who work for us for 18 months, and then we move more people in. Um, we have free tattoo removal. No place on the planet Earth removes more tattoos than we do. We uh, have a designated clinic with three laser machines. We have one paid physician's assistant, but 37 volunteer doctors, 46,000 uh, laser treatments a year. We have 10 probation camps and placements who 
bus their kids in and we remove their tattoos. Um, and it all started because of a guy named Frank who wandered two days out of Corcoran State Prison and he's, I've never met him and he's sitting in front of me in my office and tattooed on his forehead like a billboard, filling the entire space and pardon my French here, but it says, fuck the world. And he says, you know, I am having a hard time finding a job. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, Frank, may maybe we could put our heads together on this one, you know. And, uh, and uh, so I'm thinking, do I send him to McDonald's? You know, do you want fries with that? No, we don't want fries. <laughs> so I hired him, and he bagged bread for two years, and I went to a... Uh, a doctor, a dermatologist at White Memorial Hospital who uh, gave me one hour a month to chip away at F Frank's forehead and a few others. But pretty soon I had a waiting list of 3,000 gang members who wanted uh, this uh, service, so we couldn't really stay with the old arrangement. We all owe it to Frank, who uh, is now a security guard at a movie studio, and there is no trace left of the dumbest thing he'd ever done, or the angriest. And so we have a lot of case managers, uh, a huge mental health team, five paid therapists, but we have 47 volunteer therapists, so everybody's in therapy. If you don't transform your pain, you'll just keep transmitting it. And so our place is about healing. It's a therapeutic community where you gain some resilience. And then gang members re-identify who they are in the world. And then we send them forth. And the world will throw at them what it will, but this time they won't be toppled by it. And we have all our training programs in, uh, in businesses, uh, solar panel installation training program, our most successful training program. We have all our businesses, Homeboy Diner, the only place you can buy food at City Hall. Uh, we have a restaurant at the LAX American Airlines Terminal since February. Uh, we are in 26 uh, farmers markets where we sell our wares, Homeboy Homegirl merchandise where we sell our uh, logo stuff at our store and online, Homeboy Bakery is thriving, um, Homeboy Silkscreen, our biggest business, been around the longest. Uh, we have three organic mini farms that produce produce for our restaurants. Uh, what am I missing? Homegirl Cafe where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, Waitresses with attitude will gladly take your order. <laughs> and they cater. Um, some years ago, Oscar-winning actress Diane Keaton showed up uh, for lunch. as She of Academy Award for Annie Hall and uh, Godfather movies, big movie star. She shows up with a regular, a guy who's there once a week. And, and her waitress this day is Glenda. And Glenda's a big girl, been to prison, a gang member, tattooed, parolee, felon. She does not know who Diane Keaton is, and so she's taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, well, what do you recommend? And Glinda rattles off the three platillos that she particularly likes, and, and Diane Keaton says, oh, I'll have that, that second one. That sounds good. And it's at that moment something dawns on Glinda. She looks at Diane Keaton, she says, wait a minute. I feel like I know you from somewhere. <laughs> you know, like maybe we've met. And Diane Keaton decides to sort of deflect it humbly. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I suppose I have one of those faces, you know, that people think they've seen before. And, and Glinda goes, no, now I know. We were locked up together. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, that just took my breath away when I heard it. And I, I don't believe we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings now that I think of it. But suddenly, kinship so quickly, Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress, exactly what God had in mind. And if you'll permit me to dare to say what I think is on God's mind, it, uh, we get helped by Jesus speaking to the gathered when he says that you may be one. I suppose he could have been more self-referential, but it's really about us. It's about our own kinship. It's about this own exquisite mutuality and connection to which we're all called. All of us are called to be what Alice Miller, the late great child psychologist, called enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness 
and focused, attentive love return kids to themselves. You don't hold the bar up and ask anybody to measure up. You hold the mirror up and you tell people the truth, knowing that your truth is my truth and my truth is a gang member's truth and it all happens to be the same truth and here's the truth. You are exactly what God had in mind when God made you. And then you watch as folks, especially on the margins, as they become that truth, as they inhabit that truth, and no bullet can pierce it, no four prison walls can keep it out. And death can't touch it because it's huge. But every one of you in this room knows the experience and the need of having to reach in and occasionally dismantling the message of shame and disgrace that gets in the way of people seeing their truth. The great scripture scholar Marcus Borg says that the principal suffering of the poor throughout history and throughout scripture is shame and disgrace, and I think that's quite right. Lately, I've been taking a leisurely stroll through the Acts of the Apostles, and I suppose you could just read it as a quaint snapshot of life in the earliest Christian community, or you could read it as the measure of health in any community at all. If you start to read it that way, things will just leap off the page, like see how they love one another. That's a good measurement. There's nobody needy in this community. That's an excellent metric. But my favorite one was this. It was as if I'd never heard it before. It said, and awe came upon everyone. It would seem that the measure of our health as a community, as a city, as a county, as a family might well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. It was a couple years ago that I was invited to Richmond, Virginia to speak to 600 uh, social workers and it was an all-day uh, in-service on gangs from 9 to 3 so I brought two homies with me to help me, you know, fill the time. And uh, Andre, an African-American gang member who at the time worked in my retail store. And Jose, a Latino gang member in his late 20s who, who had uh, worked his way up from our janitorial crew to becoming a valued member of our substance abuse team. A man solidly in his own recovery gang member, been to prison and everything, but also had a long stretch of time as a homeless man and an even longer stretch as a heroin addict. And he got up to tell his story, both of them did, but I, I'd never heard their stories before, and Jose got up in sort of an offhanded way and said, I, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 the social workers gasp. And he says, it sounds way worser in Spanish. <laughs> yeah, everybody laughed. We needed a laugh one sentence in, you know. He said, I guess I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California. She walks me up to an orphanage and she says, I found this kid. And she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother finally could get out of her where she had dumped me and my grandmother came and rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine, a lot of things you couldn't. Every day my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school every day First t-shirt, because the blood would seep through, and second t-shirt, you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they'd make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? And then he stopped speaking, so overwhelmed with emotion, and he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he could speak, he, 
he spoke through his tears and he said, I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. And now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. For an idea has taken root in the world, it's at the root of all that's wrong with it, and the idea would be this, that there just might be lives out there that matter less than other lives. How do we stand against that idea? We deal with a lot of things that plague us, complex social dilemmas, like kids who are in trouble and need families, or gangs, or whatever it might be, homelessness or drugs. Nobody in this room has ever met a healthy treatment plan that was born of a bad diagnosis. I don't believe that's ever happened in the history of the world. A bad diagnosis is never neutral. Uh, you know, for about 10 years I've been struggling with leukemia, and years ago I went through chemo, and occasionally I have to go back uh, to get treatments to kind of maintain this thing. Uh, but I'm doing okay. I mean, the homies still say to me, I hear your cancer's in intermission. <laughs> and I said, yes, apparently it's stepped out to the lobby to buy popcorn. <laughs> May the line be long. <laughs> this summer I had to get back into treatments uh, and I have to do some more th through Thanksgiving. And, uh, and word travels among homies, and so I get a, a call from jail, collect. And uh, this homie says, I, I need you to be honest with me. I said, I will. Are you dying? I said, no, I'm not dying. Whew, that's what I thought. I told this guy, I said, I know G has cancer, but he's getting that shit fixed. <laughs> I said, slow down with the medical jargon. Uh, hard for me to keep up. Uh, but I went to give blood. I used to always give blood uh, a couple times a year. Uh, my dad always gave blood. I always thought this was a good thing to do, and I had the kind of blood that people, everybody could use, so I went to do it like I normally did, and the guy kind of turned white and said, I can't tell you anything, you got to go to your doctor. So I went to my doctor, and he said I had mono. So for a year, he treated me for mononucleosis. And now, I think we can all agree, there's probably a difference between leukemia and mono, you know, and, but a bad diagnosis is not neutral. It puts you behind the eight ball, you lose time. It, and you don't want to do it. You want to get the diagnosis right. And boy, have we gotten this diagnosis wrong, at least in, ter in my world, in terms of the gang thing. But I think it has resonance with all the complex social dilemmas. So there I am on the Dr. Phil show. I know, what was I thinking? But uh, <laughs> he was going to dedicate the whole hour to Homeboy Industries. I figured, well, how bad can this be? And we thought we had talked the producers down from doing something dumb. And, and so, uh, you know, there I am backstage and I can hear Dr. Phil. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the founder and executive director of Homeboy Industries, Father Greg Boyle. So I go up there and it's a kind of a uh, kind of bleachers with studio audience and, and they're clapping. And to my horror, there's Phil sitting in his stool in the middle of the stage. Well, my empty one is next to him awaiting me. But on his side of the stage is a beautiful, gorgeous mahogany coffin on one of those four-wheel... Uh, gurney deals. On my side of the stage is a perfectly constructed, uh, reconstructed jail cell with bed, sink, toilet, bars. They went to great expense uh, for these two set pieces. Well, you already know where this is going to go. So um, the producers have flown out three uh, young males, 14, 15, 16, African-American, Latino, and a white kid, 
flew them from different parts of the country with their very distraught single mothers. And, uh, and so one by one they came out. And Phil would sort of grab them figuratively by the lapel and say, don't you see where this choice of yours uh, is going to lead? And obviously they were kids who were sort of gravitating perilously close, I guess, to gang involvement. Don't you see where it's going to lead? To death or to prison? Finally, by the third kid, I couldn't take it anymore. So I said, Phil, how do I break this to you? These kids know this better than we do. They know that it will lead to death or to prison. They don't care that it will. And that's the key diagnostic moment. Nobody in this room has ever met a hopeful kid who joined a gang. I do not believe that's ever happened in the history of kids or the history of gangs. Hopeful kids don't. This is about a lethal absence of hope. Gangs are the places kids go when they've encountered their life as a misery. And who doesn't know by now that misery loves company? And if a kid can't imagine a future for himself, then his present isn't compelling. And if his present doesn't compel him, then he won't care whether he inflicts harm. And he won't care either whether he ducks to get out of harm's way. The profile of the kid who joins the gang, there are only three. There aren't four, there aren't eight, there are only three. There's the kid who's so despondent that he ceased to care about himself and consequently he can't care about you. The second kid is the, the traumatized kid, so damaged that he cannot see his way clear to transform his pain, so he just keeps transmitting it. And the third kid is the mentally ill kid. It's one and three, or three and two, or a combination of all of them. But that's it. There isn't a fourth, fifth, or sixth profile. That's it. And if we knew that diagnosis happened to be true, what would we do as a society? We'd infuse hope to kids for whom hope is foreign. We would heal kids who are traumatized because a damaged kid will cause damage. And we will deliver mental health services in a culturally appropriate and timely manner. Would that basically handle this? Basically, yeah. Our diagnosis matters because no healthy treatment plan was ever born of a bad one. Parentheses, uh, I'm a priest and a Jesuit priest, just like our Pope. And so uh, I say mass in 25 different detention facilities in the county, all the probation camps, juvenile halls, jails, on a rotating basis. So that's my church. And I was at this probation camp, and after mass I was, uh, you know, I was all vested, and we finished mass, and the homies come around, you know, and. And I'm always handing out my card, you know. Uh, thousands come to uh, Homeboy Industries um, for help. 95% of all gang members just want a reason to get up in the morning and, not a, and a reason not to gangbang the night before. They just want their moms to be proud. 5% are really exceedingly damaged, and, but 95% of them want this. And so I hand out thousands of my cards and uh, for 25 years, the Homeboy Industries is a place where uh, gang members are comfortable in going, you know. People can say, does it work? I, they wouldn't be here if it didn't. And, and they come in large numbers with it. We had enough possibilities for them. But anyway, they're always asking for my card. I was at a camp the other day, and a, a homie said, hey, how do I get your credit card? <laughs> I said, I don't know, jack my wallet, I guess, you know. <laughs> Oh, you, this, I'm sorry, I, was, I misunderstood. So after mass at this camp, I was, uh, you know, we were getting, I was cleaning up, and, and homies come around, and they want my card. And, and one homie said, hey, I saw you on Oprah. I said, no, actually, no, it was Dr. Phil. Oh, I said, yeah, I have a hard time telling those two apart myself, you know. And, and this kid over here said, you were on Dr. Phil? Fighting with your wife. Well, these guys died laughing, you know, and he didn't know what's so funny, you know, and uh, 
I said, yeah, but you know, he really gave us good advice and we're doing much better. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll be sure to tell her you were asking for. Anyway, I'm going to uh, tell you one last story because I, uh, I know you have the nuts and bolts of this uh, day. Uh, you know, people always ask me about uh, uh, enemies working together. It's probably the question I get asked most. And how can people who hated each other uh, work side by side? You know, homie will come into my office and he'll say, I'm ready, ready, ready. And uh, I'll say, okay, I have an opening in the bakery, uh, but you have to work with X, Y, and Z. And I rattle off the names of rivals, enemies. And they always do the same thing. They think for a long ass time, you know, and before they say anything to me, they go, uh, oh, all right, I'm going to work with them, but I'm not going to talk to them. You know, which used to bother me a long time ago until I realized that it's impossible for human beings to demonize people they know. Humans cannot sustain that. So I, I had this uh, homie everybody called Youngster, a little chaparito, a little tiny kid. Um, that was his gang name, Youngster. Sometimes, you know, I, I, sometimes I'll use gang names if they're benign, you know, uh, shorty, lefty, <laughs> Youngster, you know. Uh, I won't if it's, you know, Sniper or uh, Psycho. I don't, I don't really do that, you know. I had a homie in my office the other day, a big, huge guy, right out of prison. I said, what do your homies call you? Fluffy. <laughs> I said, I am trembling in my boots there. <laughs> so I have this kid, youngster, and, I, and I, I walk him into our homeboy silkscreen factory, our biggest business. Thousands and thousands and thousands of gang members in the last quarter of a century have worked their way through there. And I've learned how to work and how to take orders from disagreeable supervisors, which we provide all free of charge. <laughs> and so I'm introducing him to his 30 coworkers, and I, and I watch him as he shakes hands with each one, including enemies. There were a lot of rivals there. And he, a firm handshake, looked him in the eye, and I thought, wow, this is great. Until youngster gets to this last guy, a guy everybody called Puppet. And... Uh, Puppets seem to be wanting to avoid this encounter altogether. And, and then I, when the two of them were in each other's vicinity, they mumbled something, they stared at their shoes, they wouldn't shake hands. Well, I know they're enemies because I know what gangs they're from, but he just finished shaking hands with other enemies. I discover later that this is a hatred that's really personal, very deep, uh, beyond which neither of them think they can really get past. So I sense that much at the moment, and I say, look, if you guys can't hang working together, let me know. I've got a bunch of people who want this job. Calladitos, they don't say a word. Well, about six months later, a puppet uh, leaves his house uh, to go to a uh, corner store some distance from his home, and he buys something. On his way home, for some reason, he decides to take a shortcut, so he dodges into an alley. And because he's taken this detour, suddenly, unexpectedly, he's surrounded by ten members of a rival gang, ten against one. And they beat him badly, and he falls to the ground, and while he's lying there, these guys just won't stop kicking his head until he's lifeless. Somebody finds his body and takes him to White Memorial Hospital, where he's declared effectively brain dead. But it's the policy there to keep you connected to machines for 48 hours so you can get two full days of a flat read with uh, no brain activity, allowing the doctors to make it official and to sign the death certificate. This allowed a family and friends to gather and I was at St. Louis University giving a talk. I flew home immediately. I've seen a lot of horrible things in my life. But nothing to compare to the sight of this young man with his head swollen many times its size. It was horrifying. You could barely train your eyes on him. And so at the end of the 48-hour period, uh, I gave him a blessing I anointed his forehead with oil con la unción de los enfermos and then we disconnected 
And a week later, I buried him. But in the first 24 hours, I'm alone in my office. It's 8.30 at night. While Puppet is still beaten, lying in the hospital. And the phone rings. And it's Youngster, Puppet's co-worker from the silkscreen factory. And he says, hey, that's messed up about what happened to Puppet. I said, yeah, it is. And then with a certain kind of eagerness even, he says, is there anything I can do? Can I give him my blood? And we both fall silent under the weight of it until finally he breaks the silence, choking back his tears, and he says with great deliberation, he was not my enemy. He was my friend. We worked together. Now, can I say that always happens at Homeboy Industries? Of course. Any exceptions? Not a single one. And it shouldn't surprise us that God's own dream come true for us, that we be one, just happens to be our own deepest longing for ourselves. For it turns out, it's mutual. No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no peace. We work for kinship and all these other things as a byproduct fall into place. And so what you do is you stand at the margins with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away, but especially kids. And I don't know, maybe people might accuse you of wasting your time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And so you go from this conference to make those voices heard and good for you. For the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, we wait for it. Thank you very much and have a great day.